about that. <laughs> All right. show you. I wanted to share my story with everyone. Okay, good morning, folks. Happy Palm Sunday. Did everyone get some palms? If, don't make me think about that, okay? 
I'm not handing any more of them out. There's a reason for that. Okay, so if you want some palms, come on up and, and grab some. Hey, I wanted to share with you uh, this week, all of a sudden, bam, it like hit me that uh, Easter's next week. And uh, if, you, if you remember, you know, we have that, that large Paschal candle. It's called a Paschal candle that's here, okay? And uh, I thought all of a sudden, oh my goodness, I need to get another one of those. If you've ever <clears throat> questioned the R value, the R value of stained glass, I will show you what it is. <laughs> so last year I took the stand and the candle in it, and I put it by the window in my office, a stained glass window, one of the stained glass windows in my office. Now my office gets sort of warm on sunny days. The sun comes across those back windows, okay? And uh, it gets a little warm in there. It, you know, with the, um, when it's windy outside, you can actually feel air through the stained glass. Like, that's, that's, that, that's why I say the R value. So I look up one day after a hot, sunny day, and that's my Paschal candle from last year. So we're not going to use that one. I, had, <laughs> I actually thought about trying to, trying to heat it up, but it was easier to just buy another one. So anyhow, that's my, uh, that's my, my candle. So hey, um, speaking of which, leading up to Easter, this is a, this is a really cool week coming up here. This is, this is it. Like this, this week, everything about this week, this is what defines us as Christians. This is it. It's not Christmas, you know. It's not Christmas. It's this week. It's Easter. It is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that defines us as Christians, defines us as we are. So uh, what I'd like you to be aware of is there are numerous services Coming up this week, Monday, Thursday, Thursday evening is Monday, Thursday. What is Monday, Thursday? Okay, Monday, Thursday, and there's a reason it's a Latin word kind of thing, but whatever. The, the, what happened Thursday night of the week that Jesus um, was, uh, was crucified, Thursday night is what we call the Last Supper. That, that is when the Last Supper was, was celebrated together, and it was on Friday, Good Friday, well, it was that night, Thursday night, that Jesus was arrested. And, of course, it was Friday that he was crucified, okay? So Thursday night, what we call Monday Thursday, is the night that we celebrate the Passover, or, uh, the, the final Passover, the sharing of the bread and the cup. So Thursday night is communion, because that's what Jesus did Thursday night. Okay, so I would invite you to come out for that to share communion again to commemorate what Jesus did that that evening. That is, we call it, it. It is the final Passover, the last Passover meal celebrated. The Passover happened in Egypt when a lamb was slain in each home, and the blood of that lamb was painted on the doorposts of the home in, when the when the uh, Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And the angel of death visited Egypt that night, but spared the children in the homes that were marked by the blood of an innocent lamb. Okay? That's, that's when Passover started. Okay? What Jesus celebrates on Thursday night is the final Passover. Okay? The lamb of God is about to be slain for the world. Okay? So no, you know, we say these words, we think about these things, we say these words, but you need to understand what it's all about, okay? So that's Thursday. Friday, Good Friday, obviously, is the day that Jesus is crucified. And we have not done this before, but typically uh, it has been uh, celebrated in many churches that it, it is thought that Jesus hung on the cross for three hours, between the hours of 12, noon, and 3 noon and three. And so in many churches, there are times to come in and just be, spend some time in prayer during that, that 12, to, 12 to three time frame. okay? Um, you know, in years past, they don't do it so much anymore, but even some businesses would give you off from 12 to three uh, during, during that time of the day, okay? So what we're doing this year is the sanctuary will be open for a time of Good Friday prayer and reflection. The sanctuary will be open, okay? And every half hour on the half hour, I will, I will start a video. 
Uh, the video walks us through the 14 stations of the cross, okay? Very, very powerful, uh, very powerful video. It lasts for about 17 minutes. <clears throat> the video is about 17 minutes long. So what I'm inviting you to do is come in ahead of that video, spend some time, just quiet reflection. The video will start. You can sit through it and watch it and then spend a little bit of time afterwards in prayer. And you can stay and watch it again if you want to. It doesn't, you know, you can stay as long as you want. But that's how the, that's how the day will work. So beginning at noon, <clears throat> every half hour on the half hour, the video will play and uh, you are invited then to just stay and spend some time in private, private reflection. If you've not done that before, I encourage you, if you can, if you can get here, if you're not working, um, that you would, you would give, you would try that. You would try that. We, we so seldom allow ourselves to just stop, to just stop and be in God's presence. We, we so seldom do that. This is a perfect day uh, to do that. Okay? 12 to 3. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. Give, give a, a call to the office. Um, and then, of course, on Easter Sunday, uh, we'll have a sunrise service at Frick Park at 7.30. Uh, a nice breakfast afterwards back behind us here. There'll be some good, good food for that uh, starting at about 8.30-ish. And, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll have uh, worship, at, uh, worship at 10. So a special Sunday for me personally. I, uh, I'm going to have the privilege of uh, baptizing my niece's son on Easter Sunday, which is really fun because Easter was traditionally in the church, the early church, Easter Sunday was the day of baptism. All converts were baptized on Easter Sunday. So to be able to do a baptism on Easter Sunday is, is very special for me. So it'll be a, a very fun day, okay? Any other announcements? Anything else announcement-wise? Yep. Yes, if you're gonna come to breakfast on, uh, on Sunday. If you're thinking you might get here for all or part of it, let's, let's make it easy. Anyone who thinks they're going to get there for all or part of breakfast next week, raise your hand. Come on, hands go up. Lots of hands. You get an approximate number. You don't need names. Just get, just get numbers, okay? Come on out for breakfast. It'll be fun, okay? All right, let's worship together. That'll get you going, right? Come on. Would you please stand and join me in our call to worship? 
I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. Yes, Lord, the Lord is good. Give praise to the Lord. Amen. Let's uh, remain standing and join together in our praise hymn, number 280. Oh, that's right. There's a little lesson going on here, right? We're just starting right into it. Okay. Wait, let me get out of your way. Let us join together. Please remain standing and we'll join together in our affirmation of faith. Join me, please. Christ appeared in the flesh and was shown to be righteous by the Spirit. He was seen by angels and was announced to the nations. At the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only Almighty God, the King of kings and the Lord of Lords. To him be honor and glory and power forever. Amen. You may be seated.
<laughs> Thank you, Debbie. Wonderful. That's uh, that was a pretty technical piece just they then. Worked really, hard. really hard. Yes, yes. I'm always interested to see. Uh, uh, what, uh, how Jill feels when she comes home from practice on Wednesday night. I always get a sense of, uh, you know, how it's going to go on Sunday kind of thing. So good stuff there. Was that distracting, Colleen? Were you able to keep rhythm? With <laughs> you know, last week I, uh, we talked about this idea, I was sort of kidding around about the whole HGTV thing and walk-in closets and stuff. And, um, you know, it is something to, to kid about a little bit, but, you know, it sort of came home to me this week. We, uh, we mourn the loss of uh, Wayne Malone this week, uh, a man who lived a, a good long life a good, long life, right? And um, we, we mourn his loss. And, and I, it just started me thinking again about what's, what's important, you know? And we talk about, you know, large walk-in closets filled with things and storage places for our stuff. Kind of thing, and I know I kid a lot about it. I, I really do, and I am just kidding. I, for all I know, most of you here have walk-in closets and storage places too. So, but you know, the scripture did speak to this, did speak to this issue, and in um, in Luke chapter chapter twelve, there's a, a story about a rich man. If you have your scripture open, it's in Luke 12, and uh, this particular parable is called the parable of the rich fool. You know, when I read those kinds of words, I'm always somewhat inclined to water it down a little bit, because I don't like using that phrase for, for anyone, but scripture is scripture, and um, I had a professor in seminary who once said, you know, sometimes you have to let the Bible say what the Bible says. And so this is the story of a man, a rich man. And Jesus tells this parable. He says, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Now again, Putting, putting it more in modern terms, we don't, we don't grow crops. We here don't really have crops that we have to worry about storing. But what do we have? We have our stuff. I have no place to store my stuff. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And Jesus concludes this parable, this is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. This is, this is a, a difficult word to us, especially in our, our highly materialistic culture today. And um, when we don't have enough stuff, enough, big enough place to put our stuff, we, we build more, more places to put it. And Jesus says, yeah, no, that's not the way to do it. Because then that becomes our focus. That becomes what, we're, what we think about. It's interesting that the next section of this particular chapter is entitled, Do Not Worry. So from this point in this story, Jesus goes on to, to, to the teaching, do not worry about what you will eat or drink or what you will wear. All these things will be provided to you, but seek first the kingdom of God. So you see, 
God, God puts those two in back to back with each other. Don't store up for yourself things on this earth, but also don't worry about the things of this earth. I will provide them for you. You do not need to build for yourselves bigger barns. You don't have to build bigger areas to store your, to store your stuff just to think that you're protecting yourself somehow. I think in our culture today, it has nothing to do with protection. It's just we want more stuff. And Jesus is saying, yeah, no, that's not the way to do it. And it made me think about that as I, as I thought about Wayne. I know a little bit about the life of Wayne, obviously the Malone uh, family. And um, he lived a rich life and did not store up for himself things on this earth. And at some point, for every one of us, God's going to say, tonight, your life is required of you. Where will we have put our faith and trust? If the usher would come forward, please.
as I mentioned a moment ago, um, Wayne Malone uh, passed this week after a relatively brief illness. Uh, Wayne is the husband of Carol Malone, uh, father of, of Mark, and um, grandfather of Kayla and Randy. And so we will celebrate his life uh, here on Wednesday. The viewing and the service both will be here at the church, in the church, in the sanctuary. Uh, the viewing will be from uh, 10 to noon, 10 to 12, and the funeral will happen right, uh, right at the 12, or right after the, the viewing. Uh, I, I've neglected to mention, uh, because of that, we will not have a Wednesday Bible study this week. For those of you who attend the Wednesday Bible study, we will not uh, have Bible study this week. Uh, but I would encourage you, if you have some time, to, to come out and celebrate the life of, of Wayne Malone and uh, support uh, the Malone and Lawfer family in their, in their time of, of grief. Wayne was 94, and I have to tell you, you know, even in the hospital, laying there, he, he was a healthy looking 94. Unfortunately, you know, some things messed up inside, but uh, boy, I, was, I would not have guessed him at 94. Um, also, I'll let you know, I visited with uh, Molly this week. Uh, she's doing well. Uh, I, I think it would uh, take the second coming of Christ to keep her from coming to church on Easter Sunday. Uh, so um, I, I suspect we'll see her next week. But I did get a call from her afterwards, sadly, that her, uh, her son-in-law uh, in Texas has been diagnosed with uh, leukemia recently. And um, so we want to continue to, uh, we want to lift up uh, her family uh, in, this, in this time. I, I do not... I want to say Craig, but don't hold me to that. I don't remember his name off offhand. But uh, married to uh, to Molly's daughter, they live in in uh, the Houston area, I believe. Uh, they have uh, a son who uh, has a two-year-old, uh, what would be Molly's great-grandchild as well. So, so let's pray for for Molly in her continued healing, and for her son-in-law who was recently diagnosed. Um, you know, we talk about this whole thing with cancer. It just seems to, you know, seem to be hearing about it a lot. You know, I, I can't help thinking, of course, about the, the princess. What's her name? Kate. 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 I forgot her name. Um, clearly, uh, an indicator that cancer is no respecter of persons, right? It can hit any family, any time, anywhere. It doesn't matter what your status is what your wealth is, none of that matters. Uh, it, it can affect us all. And we're, we're certain, it's interesting, on that, the night that I saw that report, uh, there was also a follow-up report about a, a significant increase in cancer in, in younger, especially in younger people, uh, younger being under like 50 kind of thing. So let's, let's be in prayer uh, about that for, for, for her, for everyone. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, there is uh, barely a week that goes by that we do not hear of another who has been struck with, uh, with cancer or you know, any, any uh, number of other illnesses. It affects us all. It affects us individually, within our families, within our circles of friends. And therefore... It should affect each and every one of us here. Lord, we, uh, we grieve and we mourn with the Malone and Lawfer families as they, uh, they mourn the loss of Wayne. We ask you to be with them in this, this time, this time of grief and sadness, even with the assurance of a resurrected life Lord, where there is no sickness, there is no cancer, there is no illness, there is no pain and suffering, there are no tears, in that we can rejoice, but it in no way diminishes the loss that we feel uh, when we lose a, a loved one here. So we ask you to be with their family as they prepare 
uh, to, uh, to say a final goodbye to Wayne on Wednesday. We lift up our sister Molly, who has been going through her own trials and struggles physically, emotionally, and um, we grieve that uh, as things were starting to look better for her physically, she receives this very unwelcome news from her son-in-law. So we pray, Lord, that um, we don't know any of the details. We just we simply pray that it was something that was perhaps caught very quickly, can be dealt with, and uh, we pray for, for healing for him. Lord, we lift up the many others in our, in our lives to whom we, we pray to you for today, and we ask, and that each of us asks for us as a family to pray for Kathy and Brian and Joel, for Donna M. For all those facing cancer and for Princess Kate that was here as well. For Jordan and Barry, for Amy and Wally, Trish and Elena, Shelby and Sally. Lord, we lift up Brian and Sonia Brandon for uh, MRI test, Betty and John and Bridget. We pray for Uncle Babe, Ron and Bill H, for Darcy, Joanne and Roger. Lord, we pray for Alana who, who is fighting her own cancer battle and um, maybe uh, maybe nearing the end of that battle for herself. For Richard and Paula and Terry, for Cheryl C. and Cheryl L., for Norma Jean and Donna and Paul. We pray for Terry and Ron, for Michaela and Jonathan, for Alana. Pray for Emily and Dolly, Dolly and Jim, and for Connor, Cheryl C. and Obadiah, is that my, um, Deli excuse me, Delilah, Delilah, uh, Cameron, for the Malone family, for Linda S. and Linda Y., for Mary Ann and Colin, Nick and Danny, for Marcia and Haley. For Amy, for Mandy, and for Joe. Lord, all these we lift to you today. We ask you to be present in their lives and in their circumstances, Lord, and for each of us as well. Lord, we are each facing different things in our, in our lives right now, moments that are filled with joy, some that are filled with anxiety and fear. Lord, whatever that may be, we know that each step of the way you are walking beside us. As the story tells us, sometimes you're, you're walking with us. Other times, we find a need for you to carry us over those rough times. But whatever the case may be, we know that you are lost with each other, and we rejoice with each other. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this, this family, this family that, that stays together, that worships together and prays together, that shares meals together, Lord that gets to hear beautiful music and the beautiful sound of children. All these things, Lord, we give you praise and thanks for. And mostly, Lord, we praise you for the opportunity to worship you, to lift you up, to hear your word, to have our lives impacted by what your word says, Lord. Help us light a fire within each and every one of us. Don't let these words just fall on cold embers, Lord. If there is a word preached this morning, there is someone here that needs to hear that word. And we pray, Lord, that that word will carry the force and the might to make changes in lives. So we give you praise and thanks, Lord. And we come to you in this day. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. That's one of those ones, if you don't stop one time, it really stands out, right? <laughs> Colleen, we could put some toys in this back hallway here. You could shut her in there. As so long as she doesn't learn how to hit that blue button, she'd be, she'd be fine for a song, I think. <laughs> as I said earlier, today marks the beginning of what is the most important week in Christianity. Not one of the most important weeks, the most important week in Christianity. This week marks the culmination of God's redemptive plan for humanity. This is it. This is, this is the culmination of the plan. This is what defines us as Christians. The crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Death defeated. Today marks the beginning of Holy Week with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But what about this past week? 
What was happening in the life of Jesus entering the week before he enters into Jerusalem on this day? We know that in Jerusalem, the crowds would eventually turn against them. And they, when they would finally realize that Jesus was not going to be the conquering Messiah that they thought he was going to be, that they had expected. But what led up to this day? To this day? Let's read the story in Mark chapter 10. Verses uh, 46 to 52, if, you, if you're going to follow along. And they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. And throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Jesus' first miracle began in a, a little town right outside of Nazareth, a town called Cana, where he turned water into wine. His last miracle occurs right here in Jericho, where he gives sight to a blind man. It all began in an insignificant little village, and it comes to conclusion in this historically significant town overlooking the Dead Sea. For three years, throughout all of Judea, Jesus did miracles. He did signs and wonders, mighty deeds displaying his deity, his compassion, his power, all the while preaching salvation and entrance into his glorious kingdom. Through the years since his baptism at the Jordan River, he has lifted, he has filled the land of Israel with a supernatural display of power. Power over, uh, over disease, over demons, over death, over nature itself. But now it is time for the anointed one to become the rejected one. It is time for the sovereign Lord to become the sacrificial lamb. It is time to face the hatred and the animosity of the leaders of Israel, the rejection of a nation, and be crucified by the godless Romans at the hands of the Jewish religious leaders. Rejection is set. Death is inescapable. The shallow crowd that hails him when he comes into the city on this day is so fickle that in a few days they will be screaming for his execution. From this point on in scripture, from Jericho on to this final week, there are no stories of conversion. There are no stories of salvation in Jerusalem on these last days. His days before the cross are filled with sorrow once his entry is finished, it is all sadness and grief. Only a few days left, and he will be brutally executed. But on his way to Jerusalem, he makes one last stop in Jericho. 
And in Jericho, a wonderful salvation story takes place. The story of a blind man who encounters a Savior. This story is a reminder that it will not be the false religious leaders, it will not be the noble and the mighty who enter the kingdom of God. It will be the poor, the outcasts, the nobodies, and the nothings. A large crowd is with him, as indicated in the text. These people are following Jesus because they know about him and because they too are on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Jericho was a large and prosperous city, about a six-hour walk from Jerusalem. The place would have been a buzz, filled with all kinds of sights and sounds and smells. With Jesus coming into town and all the pilgrims pouring through Jericho on their way to Jerusalem, there would have been a flood of people, a flood of people, and they knew that Jesus was coming. So the crowd swells with curiosity seekers, and the streets are lined with people. It is Passover excitement, elevated and intensified, because the one who would be Messiah is coming into town. You see, just up the hill from Jericho is this little village called Bethany. Not long before this, Jesus had gone to Bethany and raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. Do you think word got down to Jericho about this? You bet it did. Everybody who went from Jerusalem through Bethany must have been told about the resurrection of Lazarus and carried the message to the next town along the way, along the way to Jerusalem, which would have been Jericho. So Jesus is the focus of considerable attention, to put it mildly. The dirt road that goes through Jericho would have been teeming with humanity, wanting to see him. But here the story takes a turn and focuses on a blind beggar. A blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus. A blind beggar sitting by the side of the road. We do not know what made Bartimaeus blind, but we do know this, that blind people were pretty much just reduced to begging because if you were blind in the theology of the Jews, you were under divine judgment. You were blind because God was punishing you. So here is this man who would have been alienated, ostracized, a man under a divine curse, begging by the side of the road. He's at the bottom, below even the peasants, below the unclean and the degraded, the lowest of the low. Luke tells us that Bartimaeus hears the crowd going by and he says, What's happening? What's happening? And somebody responds by saying, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. When he heard that it was Jesus, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David. He began to scream, to scream. The the word is krazo in Greek. Crazy. He goes crazy. It is a very strong word. He tries to be heard over the noise of the crowd, over all the disturbances and the distractions. He shouts, Jesus! Here is a man who recognizes Jesus as the true Messiah. Here is a man who knows what he needs. Mercy. He needs mercy. Bartimaeus would have understood the theology of his people and would have thought himself cursed by God because he was blind. He would have accepted that. 
He knows he needs mercy. He knows he is a sinner, and his blindness aids him in facing that. Well, his cry elicits no sympathy at all from the crowd. Verse 48 says that many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, to be quiet. They would not have been that kind. Shut up, they would have told him. But Bartimaeus knows who this man is and believes what he has heard about him. At least he believes enough of it. He understands his own condition. He is an outcast. He is a sinner. It is hammered into him day after day after day. He feels despised by the people who pass by. He could not see Jesus. He could not see the dusty stranger who was not clothed in royal robes, who did not carry a scepter, who was not ascending a throne. But he knows who he is, and he refuses to be beaten back in silence. He needs mercy, and he will fight for that mercy. His heart sees the light before his eyes ever do. His heart sees Jesus before his eyes ever gaze upon his face. Verse 49, it says that Jesus stopped. He stopped and he said, call him here. Do not silence him. Call him here. Bring him to me. Now, all of a sudden, the crowd changes their tune a little bit. Jesus' response to the man changes their attitudes for the moment. Their curiosity drives them to let this thing happen and see what is made of it. How does Bartimaeus respond? He throws aside his cloak and he jumps to his feet. And he is led to Jesus. And in verse 51 tells us that Jesus turned to him and says, What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? The Messiah says to this debased, lowly outcast, What do you want me to do for you? Unlike James and John, two of the disciples who earlier in this book argue which of them would be greater in heaven, this man only wants mercy. He knows he deserves nothing. He is not laying claim to something. Mercy means to give what someone does not deserve. And he says to Jesus, Rabboni, which means master, I want to regain my sight. I want to see. According to Mark's, excuse me, Matthew's account, Jesus then reaches up and touches his eyes. In Mark, Jesus simply says, go. Your faith has healed you. And he receives his sight. This then is more than just a healing. When Jesus says to him, go, your faith has healed you. The word for healed is Iona. Iona. That is not the word that Jesus uses in this passage. Jesus uses the verb sozo, which is the word that we translate into saved. Saved. Jesus says, your faith has saved you. Bartimaeus comes out of his blindness into sight and out of sin into salvation. And the passage finishes by saying that Bartimaeus followed Jesus along the road. No kidding, right? I believe Bartimaeus followed Jesus all the way to Jerusalem. 
He stayed with them throughout that week. I believe that Bartimaeus absolutely would have been counted one of the, the 120 that were in the upper room when the Holy Spirit filled that room. Can you grasp the picture here? A man who cannot go anywhere, who is stuck as a beggar because he cannot see, who is hopeless unless Christ comes to him. Is that not the picture of every sinner? Hopeless, sitting by the road, if perchance the healer and the Savior may come by. Jesus went to the bottom of Israel, to the lowlands of Jericho, to claim a blind beggar for the kingdom of God. And scripture says, when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. What else could they do? How else would you explain it? To them, Jesus did not just give sight to a blind man, a remarkable event in and of itself. But he showed authority over sin. He demonstrated the authority of God. Is it any wonder why they would have followed him to Jerusalem? I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a moment. Just close your eyes. I would like you to imagine yourself on the road on the side of the road as Jesus enters Jerusalem. You're cheering. You're waving your palm branch in the air. I want you to think of the sights, the sounds, the smells, the celebration that is all around you. And then I want you to imagine that Jesus, as he comes down that road, stops right in front of you. And he looks directly at you. All of a sudden, everything seems to stop. You no longer have a sense of the crowd that's shouting and pushing up against you. It's just you and Jesus. And Jesus says to you, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And you say, Heavenly Father, help us to remember that as we celebrate on this day, that although the crowds cheer, you enter Jerusalem with a, a heavy heart. You know what happens in these coming days, and you offer yourself freely to the execution that will take place not many days from now. And you do it all for us to have mercy on us. So when we come face to face with you and you ask of us, what do you want me to do for you? Let us remember Bartimaeus and let us remember the mercy that you showed to him. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn together.
in his blissful presence eternally rejoice. Let us celebrate this day of joyful triumphy. But let us remember that the days are ahead are dark. But the kingdom of God is at hand. And the way of Jesus was known from the very start. And it is this week that he freely offers himself for us to show us mercy. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.